the fact that there's, you know, a 13 year old girl out there, you know, or a, a young trans kid out there who's looking at these characters and saying, you know, at whatever age, like, oh my gosh, if they get to have the same experience that I had when I was sitting in the back of a comic book shop, you know, um, just identifying with the characters, but even, even more holy, you know. We come into this world unknown, but know that we are not alone. They try to knock us down, but change is coming. It's our time now. I want to show you. I'm not afraid to, well, this. So when's the first time you said the words, I'm gay? I never had to say it. I just am. Yeah, have this dance, my lady. You always look so nice in dresses. I was actually thinking I could maybe wear a suit to the dance. Why don't you do that? I feel more myself. Actually, Dad, I'm not a girl. Even though you've always thought of me as a girl, I'm a boy. To you people, my son has always been just another drug-addicted cautionary tale. But he was the first openly gay child of a president. You will never know the evil he suffered when he came out against his will as a boy in the White House. I am both human and alien. And I am a trans woman. I am proud of all that I am. I should be. Ah! Get out of here! We should have never tried to be normal. I'm not normal, all right? And I'm not gonna be normal for anyone. I don't want you to be normal. If I am understanding correctly, none of us should be afraid of who we are, nor should we fear sharing that. Maybe we forgot the most important part of being a hero is inspiring hope. I'm Stargirl. That's rock and roll. Welcome to Paley Front Row, presented by City. I'm Jim Halchman, the West Coast Bureau Chief of TV Guide Magazine and TV Insider. And I'm your host for this special Pride Month conversation with Mr. Greg Berlanti. Before we get to our program, I'd like to take a moment to ask you to consider supporting the Paley Center, a nonprofit organization near and dear to my heart that's dedicated to honoring excellence in media through education programs, great conversations with the stars and storytellers of critically acclaimed series like the gentleman we celebrate today, and the preservation of television's creative legacy through the Paley Archive. To help them continue to bring you more shows like this one, please go to paleycenter.org to donate right now. Thank you. Today, we welcome the acclaimed prolific writer, creator, and producer, Greg Berlanti, whose story careers encompass critically lauded dramas like Brothers and Sisters, Political Animals, Dirty Sexy Money, You, Doom Patrol, and All-American, a widely successful universe of superhero series like Arrow, The Flash, Supergirl, Batwoman, and where I first met him over 20 years ago talking teen dramas like Dawson's Creek and Everwood. LGBT plus inclusion and representation have been a hallmark of his work since the very beginning, so we can't imagine a more fitting guest during Pride Month. How are you, Greg? How are you doing today? Great, great. I want to echo your sentiments about people getting involved with Paley and giving to Paley. It's been, it's been such a vital organization to all the work we've done through the years and, uh, and so, so pivotal for so many moments for us uh, on all the different shows. And, you, and you've been a part of the Paley Center for a long time. Why do you think it's an important place for celebrating the history of inclusion and diversity that we're celebrating in Pride Month? You know, I mean, I, I think what I love about Paley is just, you know, TV is such a young art form still too, you know, and knowing its history is so important in terms of helping it evolve and change and be better, you know, and, and I think uh, uh, any showrunner I know and, and all the individuals, actors and directors I know that, you know, revere the organization for helping, I think, you know, really uh, for all of us to like look back and look inward at, at, you know, how we make this art form and then and, and talk about how we can do a better job. Yeah, and hopefully we'll be able to get back to the Paley Center for the archives because I've spent a lot of time just looking through those things and looking it's at the research. <laughs> um, so tell, tell me, let's, let's go back to when we were both a lot younger than we are now. A lot younger. A lot, um, <laughs> a lot younger. <laughs> But when you, were, when you were growing up and even before you knew you were gay yourself, what were you watching on TV and what were you kind of connecting with as far as characters and shows? Because we're always looking for people that we kind of recognize in ourselves, I guess. Yeah, so I was a kid in the 80s. Uh, you know, I was, I was born in 1972. So it was really the 80s that TV was kind of, uh, you know, and, and all that great 80s television 
uh, you know, uh, and I would, I was one of those kids who I'm sure like you got the TV guide in the fall and like memorized what new shows were going to be where and, and, uh, and, and really did in a lot of ways, uh, you know, there was no internet. So my connection to the outside world, you know, and the world that was bigger beyond if it wasn't through the library, you know, was really through my TV set and what representation I did see there and feel there. Um, you know, sadly, um, uh, there was not a lot of gay or LGBT representation at all. And usually it was, you know, uh, a perp and a crime show or, um, you know, or, or it was always a troubled storyline or a very special storyline. Yeah. Um, and and uh, so I was yearning for that kind of connection as I started to discover um, um, my, who I was. And, and equally sad uh, was the devastation that was happening to the gay community at the time through AIDS. And so when you would see TV programming, a lot of times it was just news reports you know, about who was uh, suffering and, and a group of people who were not being listened to by their government and needed help and needed support. And, um, you know, and, and simultaneously being a, a young kid in a small town witnessing this plague and this devastation while also not seeing any positive representation, you know, was a real um, a scary thing and, and a lonely thing. And I know a lot of young people who grew up in that time, you know, felt similarly. There were a few bright spots or a few moments of connection. I think, uh, uh, you know, there were this sort of very overtly, uh, though it wasn't said, um, gay men, you know, the sort of Paul Lynn of Center Square and that uh. kind of, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and um, Jim J. Bullock on Too Close for Comfort. And, uh. and, but again, it was, they were sort of poked fun at, although I'm so appreciative of them. Uh, during that time and then and then there was uh, uh steven's character i think it was steven's character on dynasty dynasty sure uh, and then there were a few uh mini series that had gay representation i think that they kind of probably felt safer about representing them in that way and th those are i whenever the subjects came up even though i wasn't incredibly in touch with my sexuality um and was really repressed you know i i knew that i was I had something in common with those individuals yeah, I remember being, I, I'll date myself, I was 10 years old when Soap came on the air. Yeah. I remember being too little to watch it, but I would sneak to the back of our living room because I could come in from the hallway and I'd watch it over the back of the couch. And I was so fascinated with the Jody Dallas character, yes. which in the beginning was very flamboyant, very stereotypical. And I didn't understand why at the point, but I think maybe there was already some curiosity there. Um, and you all look for those things. Yeah, exactly. You, you, you had that sense of, of connection and uh, grateful for those people who, you know, uh, began to break down those barriers. Yeah. Now talk to me about when you joined Dawson's Creek and there's all of a sudden you guys are going to do a gay storyline, bring in the Jack McPhee character. What was the climate like at the time? Because I think Will and Grace was probably fairly new on the air and there might be some other gay characters I on. Even say, I'm not even sure if was it just on the air, Will and Grace? It may have come on the air either the next year. I, I, you know, I want to say nine. I want to say ninety-eight. You know better was than Will I, and Grace. I, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I don't even. You know, yes, yes, because I don't even remember it being totally in the zeitgeist in that, in that way in my mind when we were yeah. discussing Dawson. So it was it was Kevin's uh, idea and cause, uh, you know, and and uh, very near and dear to him. And these characters were. I had come on, the on the very year that this was sort of happening. Um, and he had already cast Kerr Smith and had not yet told him, uh, oh. yeah, and, and that, that the character was going to be gay. So okay. he had a conversation with Kerr about it, and Kerr, to his credit, and this was not common at all, um, Kerr, to his credit, was a champ about it, was just so accepting and so excited. And then Kevin asked me to write the episodes with him um, where, the, where Kerr would come out, and uh, we were talking about story possibilities. He one time, Kevin has sort of said since, I, I think somewhere that like, it was based on something that happened to me. It actually, we, we, we use uh, <laughs> elements of things from our lives, but it was, it was a, a friend of mine had told me a story about a, a kid in his school that had been outed in, um, without his realizing it through his own writing and his poetry. Oh, okay. and, and, that was, uh, and that was sort of a basis uh, of what we used. Um, that story really moved us, and we thought, oh, it's really kind of a way for a person to expose themselves and not even realize it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and, and it was a really exciting time. We really, it was, it was uh, I had written uh, the film called Broken Hearts Club. 
Um, and Kevin knew that that writing about that subject was important to me. So I was really glad he asked. Um, and, uh, and, and it was just, uh, you know, the, everyone was really supportive about us doing that, that two-parter. Yeah, I went back and watched those two episodes because ah. I hadn't watched them in a long time. And I haven't watched them in a long time. It's, they're, they on Hulu. they're on Hulu. <laughs> they totally hold up. And that's the one thing I noticed because I, was wait, I, was, I, wanted, I expected them to feel dated because it's been 20 right. years and mm -hmm. so much has happened since then, but they really don't. And what I realized is that we still need coming out stories. Those stories, at one point, I think it felt like that's all you were getting were coming out stories. And now we can tell other stories. But seeing those episodes, I was getting... I was like, there's, there's people still going through that. People who don't understand, who are afraid of how they're feeling and what people will think. Do you, do you still think about that as well? Like why we still need coming out stories? Yes, I agree with you that we need every kind of story. And the, the coming out experience is, is obviously unique to the, gay, the LGBTQ experience. Yeah. So um, that's, you know, it is part of, it's, it's, it's part of the journey. And especially where young people are concerned, you know? And, um, uh, and so, you know, I mean, I, uh, when I worked on a film called Love, Simon that came out two years ago, we talked about that, at, you and I, and, but in taking that film around the country at the time and meeting so many young people and screening it again and again, there's what's so wonderful is just that they see a world totally differently than people saw it at the time, you yeah. know, and, and that there's no um, how accepting and how open they are and, and how they the, 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 just the vocabulary they have to discuss sexuality and gender in a way that's much more open. And, and so that's going to yield in a great way, I think, just thousands of, of better or more rich and more contemporary stories. But, but there had to be a, a first one. And so we were really, I was happy to be a part of, of that one at the time. Yeah. And what, you know, because we didn't have social media and people couldn't give you direct contact, when did you kind of know that that storyline was impacting people? I mean, we're still getting mail mailbags. Yeah, exactly. The old mailbags, <laughs> and and uh, we would get some of them. You know, I mean, Kerr would know more specifically just because I think people would come up to him a lot. Yeah. But as I would meet people at events and everything over the next couple of years, um, and then it, it even was even more like a decade later. You know, that there was so there was a whole generation that that was a pivotal um, storyline for them, and I would I would hear you know, and it was subsequent to them having their whole sort of coming out experience. And it was nice to, to think that, that, that in some way we had sent a, you know, a, a, a safety line to young people in a way that maybe hadn't been there for us. And, uh, you know, and, and it, it's just easy to forget about how valuable, how valuable that is. Yeah. And once you had the coming out stories, then, you know, you still had a couple of years of the show and there were other new territories because I think, I don't, I don't think it was the first, was it the first gay kiss or it was one of the first? I don't first know if it was exactly, it was the first romantic one maybe between two okay. characters, you know, I mean, certainly on a, in a hit primetime show, you know, in the sense of like, you know, when they had, they were about to do that a few years before on Melrose and they cut away. They cut away. And I, yeah. I was old enough to be so upset about that, you know, yeah. and, and so knowing that this was going to be our shot to sort of undo that. And, and I was just coming into taking over running the show. And I had said to the executives, it was a really important thing to me. And, yeah. and that if I did, I, I kind of bartered for it and said, if you, if I run the show, will you let me do this? Um, and then there were a lot of conversations, just a lot of conversations about how close the camera could be. And I mean, things that, you know, uh, we, we didn't really super listen to. Um, but I remember being pretty amped up about the time about thinking like, we have to get this right. There's generations that like didn't get to experience this. Um, so what can we do? So then when Dawson's Creek ended, yes. there were a lot of different things you could have done. There were more shows on the air. I did, I researched and I saw like, you know, Queer's Folk was on and L Word and shows like that, that were very gay centric. Yeah. And, but I, you know, looking at all your work, You've never done like what I would call a gay centric show. You've done shows that are broader with gay characters in the mix with everybody like they should be. But was that a conscious decision of yours or is that just where your career took you or? I, I don't know if it was super conscious. Um, I, I mean, I, I think it was a, a, just a mixture of, of, you know, I had because I had done teen stuff for so long. You know, and yeah. this is it's the business is famous for wanting to pigeonhole people because it's just easier to think about. Well, this person goes in that box or this yeah. person goes on that box. And, and not that, uh, so I, I really wanted to do a, I knew I wanted to do a family show and not just a teen 
drama and and do do adult stories too, but on network at the time. Um, and, and then that sort of evolved into what became Everwood, where we did deal with subject matter like this, um, but it wasn't necessarily always at the center. And then, and then um, moved into Brothers and Sisters, where the characters of Kevin and Scotty and, and you know, yeah. Saul and everybody, you know, where we were, we were really getting to deal with the subject matter in a more uh, straightforward way again. But but no, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't for lack of what I, I loved those shows. By the way, you know that you mentioned um, and enjoyed them as a viewer. But it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't something that I felt like um, a story that appeared in my brain. Yeah, t- talk to me about Dirty Sexy Money a little bit, which is another show you were executive producer on. And right. I've talked to Candace Kane about her storyline, and and as I've talked to other trans actors and actresses, they always bring that up. Right. And they always said that's that one like meant so much to them, and. Yeah, Candace is awesome, and, and it was incredible. And, uh, you know, Craig Wright, who created the show at the time, you know, wanted to do the storyline of, of the romantic relationship between those characters. And, and, you know, I just asked, based on my own experience, that we try and cast somebody who was trans. You know, it just, it, at, at the time, if you remember, people would cast uh, a lot of times a straight person to just play uh, a transvestite. Yeah. <laughs> not a transsexual, you know? And so it was, um, you know, I wanted, uh, I just wanted to respect the people that I knew. Um, and, and that was something that I was hearing. Um, and so, and I will say to ABC's credit, they never let us shy away from the storyline at the time, you know, they really embraced that. And there were, there were not having gone through some of the challenges we had gone through around Jack's character. Um, I thought when I got to Brothers and Sisters and Dirty Sexy Money that I, you know, and, and we had executives at the network at the time that were saying, well, that were telling us, you know, you should put a kiss in here. This is where the other characters would kiss. Um, yeah, and that's and great. So there was a real sea change that had happened. Um, and I was, you know, uh, ex- you know, obviously as a storyteller, excited by it. Well, what I remember when I watched that we watched those episodes a year or two ago was that it was like a true romantic relationship. His partner just happened to be a trans woman. Right. That's, and right. I loved how that was written that way. Yeah. And then, and then Candace came in and did such a wonderful job in the role. It got bigger and bigger, you know, yeah. and that was, and that, and that's it, like as it would for anybody else. And it was, it was great that that happens as you know, on dramas and soaps and things yeah. like that, that like, you know, a character can come in and just sort of steal the narrative because they're so great, you know? And, uh, and she was. To skip over Everwood much, but I know you did have gay characters in there as well. Did you already see the difference in getting that story or telling that story? Was it any different as far as what the network was saying or even audiences? Yeah, no, no, uh, it was very different. I mean, it wasn't by the time we had crossed whatever threshold we crossed, I mm-hmm. think uh, that that turning point, you know, in, in TV history that really happened around that time because of a lot of the shows you mentioned and because of Ellen's coming out and because of Will and Grace and, and so many people, I think they really changed the hearts and minds of, of, with their stories of, of the public. And, and it just became less of a, of an issue and, and equality um, in that way um, became more at the forefront and and more important. Talk to me about political animals, which I remember really well. I love that. Was that, I I just want to know, was it always intended to be kind of a shortened series or was that just the way it ended up playing out? It was definitely, we were going to do it as a mini and then we started making it and everybody got so excited by it, um, our in-house at the time that they thought, well, maybe we could do more. And then it aired and it did nothing in the ratings. Had, (laughs) I believe, obviously had streaming been along right now, I think at the time it would have, it would have, we've had so many shows that are similar in a way. Uh, shows like Jack and Bobby, you know, yeah. like, that, that, like, I think in a different environment where how many people watched on the first night was less important, right? Um, you know, would still be here, uh, just by virtue of the, the, the people like the actors that we had involved in that show. Um, but we had on that show, we had obviously Sebastian Stan's character, who was the first uh, uh, out child of a president, um, yeah. and how tortured um, he sort of was by that. Though he slept with, I don't know if I'd call him bi retroactively, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I think that there was, uh, I think he, he was discovering large parts of himself still. And yeah. I think that's what made the character exciting. Um, but he slept with men and women, I think, on the show. If I remember, again, it's another one I haven't seen in a long time. But we just, you know, he was uh, a really an exciting actor to write for, too. 
I, what I remember about that is that his character was really messy. And I felt like a lot of times the gay character was very noble and a good person. Yeah. And, he, and he was very complicated. And you love to watch what he was going through and what he was doing mostly because he was very yeah. manipulative in that. He was very flawed. Um, yeah. I think, I think uh, if you remember from Survivor, Richard Hatch was the first sort of like very <laughs> flawed gay character on TV. <laughs> Uh, after all that stuff where we were like oh yeah. god he's a, good, he's a great villain and they're not afraid to do that you know, and, and, and reality television has been responsible for a lot of uh, you know growth in narrative t television through the years you know because when you start capturing real life people and you start getting executives on narrative TV saying, well, we need our characters to be as interesting or as exciting. Yeah. And, you know, and, and we did, we wanted to do someone that was obviously was a very, um, um, because, and, and just more because so many times there's a black sheep of a presidential family that just, um, and go figure, this makes total sense. Like they can't survive the scrutiny. Um, yeah. and, and is not built for that kind of limelight, you know, and, and, um, and the, the sense of comparison to the weightiness of, of history and to the other members of the, the great other members of their family. Sometimes those people actually go on to be very successful elected officials. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we actually always kind of figured, like, ironically or not, you know, we were going to sort of start him really messy. But, uh, you know, if we were to be successful and tell further stories to actually have him years later, you know, grow up. Uh, yeah. you know, and and and, uh, and grow out of these experiences because a lot of your early work and into the 2000s and that reality TV was really taking over yeah. it, and it was interesting that we were seeing stories and char characters I'll say but did, did you feel that that did open doors how you could tell scripted stories because audiences could get used to a gay character in a way that we maybe didn't see on a scripted show did I think so that? many I think so many nuances uh, you know, so many times, you know, way back in the Everwood days, and this doesn't have to do with LGBT issues, but one of the ways that I was able to get uh, some of the storylines that we did do, um, you know, we dealt with abortion and, and I, I, we had a character who uh, on that show who, who had an abortion that wasn't medically induced because they had a car accident, which was the only way that people would be able uh, to do abortions since Maud, yeah. by the way. Um, and, and it had been that long. So however many 20 years or whatever. And so, um, um, and that was, that was actually the, the, the one on, on that, that issue around that show was, was as hot button and as dicey getting it on air as had been, uh, the gay kiss. So, um, wow. and so we, 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 we really wanted to, uh, show the complexity of, of, you know, tell the complexity of a story like that in a small town. And, and the, what allowed for us to sort of make those arguments was, you know, to me, if you're going to do a network television show, forgetting about maybe how exciting a reality show might be, but, you know, you have the news on at seven o'clock at night and they're, you know, dealing with these issues. Or we used to have Oprah on dealing with these issues uh -huh. head on. Uh, and then, you know, to not have narrative shows on TV dealing with those same issues just seems so old fashioned to me. Um, and that was the case, you know, we would make and, um, and I think still make, you know, I think, I think yeah. people want to see the characters, especially if you're not doing a cop show or a medical show or, or even if you are, but, but, but if the story engine of the show is what's happening in the lives of those characters, and that is somehow muted because of people's fears or concerns that the storyline is going to get to this or that. You know that is that's the that is the story engine. That's the thing that's driving the the the, the plot. You know, is what happens in those people's lives, and it should feel like what's happening in our lives. Yeah, I don't think anybody talks about going to watch Grey's Anatomy because they want to see what's the case of the week. Right. It's you want to see what's going on with the relationships or the personal exactly. You know, all that stuff. Yeah. And still, you know, and, that, and that's what makes yeah. it vital. I think. Now, by by this point in your career, you've you've worked on a lot of different shows, written a lot of different characters and storylines. Was there one that you feel is closest, closer to you, either your experience or just your own coming out process? Or was there one that's closer? I think uh, that's a great question. I, I think it takes me years to realize that. Do you know what I mean? I, I'm yeah. just sort of just now looking back, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, years since we made it, but uh, on Everwood and seeing how much of, you know, I thought I was sort of all the characters, but really it was, it was, you know, so much um, what Ephraim had gone through was sort of similar. 
I, I felt so I realized I was still working through stuff from my my youth and my high school experience, you know. And so um, I, I, off the top of my head, I would say, you know, probably probably that one. And then and then more recently in the superhero stuff, uh, you know, I had always really identified with Barry Allen as a kid. And 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 um, I think, uh, you know, that was that was a character when we were um, writing the pilot and working on the show that I I you know, the voice came rather easily to me because it was it would just felt like, OK, I, I know I, I know this guy. Yeah. That's great. Um, so talking about the, the, your DC shows, and I've covered all those from the start, but once, once yeah. you did get into that, and comic books have already had LGBTQ characters, right. but it is a different thing to watch it, because sci-fi, I think, is still a little slow as far as the grandscape of sci-fi. But you've been able to put those characters and stories in, I think, all these shows. Um, yeah. But what were the challenges there, just knowing that's a different kind of audience and you know, the material might be different, but at the essence, we watch those shows for the characters. I watched The Flash for Barry Allen. Correct. You know what I mean? When we started to, you know, deal with the subject matter, you know, it's, it's interesting when you're, when you're, I think that the impetus is the same, which is the shows become more real and more in, vital and interesting when they reflect the world we live in. So whether you're, you know, and we're dealing with, we, we take very seriously um, the responsibility of ushering incredibly important characters to individuals that people mark their entire life by into a new generation. But, you know, many of them were created in the forties, fifties, sixties. Um, and they reflected the people making those books at that time, which is not what our world looks and feels like today. And so um, I think a real responsibility for us has been to really look to change the gender and the sexuality and the race of the characters to make them reflect, you know, um, who we are. And so there's always been, there's always a lot of conversations about each of those choices, but, you know, the same thing obviously goes for the LGBT characters, you know, and that, you know, and, and, and whereas I think 10 years ago, people might've said, well, this is a family show, which was code for, you're not allowed to go there, you know? <laughs> and, um, and I, and, and I don't think that anyone feels that way anymore. And so now the fact that there's, you know, a 13 year old girl out there, you know, or a, a young trans kid out there who's looking at these characters and saying, you know, at whatever age, like, oh my gosh, if they get to have the same experience that I had when I was sitting in the back of a comic book shop, you know, um, just identifying with the characters, but even even more holy, you know? Yeah. Talk about um, with, with Batwoman, outside of the casting stuff that's gone on recently, but still just getting that show off the ground yes. and really breaking ground there. Yes. I would like to think that was not complicated and hard because of the history you'd already established but were there challenges there just because it was the first lead that was lgbtq no i think everyone realized it was time you know and again there had been uh the other shows the characters on the other shows had been popular and yeah. and so um you know it really was as it is for all the characters you know about getting it right and Caroline Dries, who's the you know showrunner of that show, is is a remarkable talent. She came from Vampire Diaries, and she um, you know the, it, the comic this particular character and this comic book had always been such a passion of hers. Um, she literally left a deal at another studio just to come back and do this show, um, and she's always had it in her uh, the vision up for it, and always had it in her you know in her teeth. I remember um, before I was a TV guy and I did a lot of LGBT press and I remember thinking like, when are we going to not have to have these conversations? Yeah. When don't we need to? But then I thought, well, that might be the wrong question I'm asking myself right. because it's not about us being normal or being a part of the zeitgeist, but it's just right. being there. But there is a story and a history that needs to be told. Yeah. I don't know what my question is there, but it was something I kept thinking about and I thought, well, like we were talking everyone about the coming out stories wanting to wait. Yeah. So when are we going to be through this moment? You know? Um, and, yeah. and the reality is we're not, it's always going to be ever changing and ever growing. And there will no doubt be, um, <laughs> you know, someone you'll be interviewing 10 years from now, perhaps, or sitting across <laughs> from, uh, that is, is, you know, looking back at, at the stuff I was lucky to be a part of and thinking that wasn't enough or, uh, we could have done more and they'll in part be right. You know, I mean, I, I think that, that there really is more that we can be doing. I think one of, one of the, the responsibilities and the things that gives me most joy in the business right now is to help shepherd other voices that um, are younger 
that you know are more open in a thousand other ways and see the the complexities of this issue and others in a thousand other ways um and you know and and really um you know get in there to uh you know tell really stories for today the way that i looked at you know um stuff around the jack kiss and things like that and thought well why not you know like why why shouldn't we do this story yeah. you know and uh and so you know i do look to the younger writers to guide the way on that and 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 the best thing i can do now is to just provide them the support i think and i have nieces who are in college and i'm constantly texting them and calling them and i'm always wanting to know their perspective on things yes. what surprises you about some of the young writers and how the lgbtq stories and characters is it is it much different than you and i just because we're 20 plus years older I got some statistic and I, you know, I, to be honest, I don't know its validity. So I feel weird mentioning it except for the fact that it really stuck with me. Um, um, when I was bringing Love, Simon out, um, one of the reports that we got on young people like 18 or below, something like 50% of them didn't consider themselves straight cisgendered, you know, like they really thought like so and 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 that number was so staggering to me yeah. that they had that much self-awareness to see you know um again to to be looking at themselves at whatever age and you know be examining themselves and uh knowing and keeping the door <laughs> as many doors open as possible and and hopefully we're continuing to provide them with the kind of support so that they can explore those areas in a safe way and have that kind of courage although i think a lot of them don't even see it that way they just see it as uh uh just as it, whatever it is you know yeah and people our age are like going wow you really think things that way yeah. and that's the way it's like wow yeah. i wish i'd done that 30 40 years ago no i mean i think i i i do i mean i i i guess i would ask of of my lgbtq brothers and sisters that are our age to have that kind of uh open-mindedness um, you know, on all these issues and, and to, to take the time to learn from young people, um, you know, what their experience has been and, and the language that comes along with that, the open mindedness and, and to give them the kind of open heart and open mind that we got that we wanted and, and needed just around the issue of being gay, you know, and I, I do think the issues are, 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 are more specific and now and, and more complex and and, and they are experiencing the world in a different way. And that's a great thing. And so there's a lot we can learn from them. Outside of this kind of hold that we're in right now during the pandemic and everything, things are not really in production, but once things get going again, what's, what's next for you? I think I saw something you're doing with Jim Parsons um, equal. Yes. We're can doing talk about equal, that a little bit. Yeah. We're doing a mini series on gay history prior to Stonewall. Um, you know, and, and, uh, uh, there's a great doc that was one that, that I watched years ago and it's still around. I think Apple has it up now for called before Stonewall, you know, and, and, and so much of that. Um, but it was, that was the last one that I even saw available on, on this gay uh, LGBT, you know, history prior to, um, um, Stonewall, you know, and I think a lot of people think it just began there you know and like suddenly people are like we're gay you know like yeah. it, it, it's like there was so much to it prior to that um and and so that's what we're exploring with some amazing talent that i don't think has been entirely announced by hbo max okay. so i'll let them announce it okay. um uh and there's an incredible way um uh, that it's just being shaped and and uh you know it's 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 part it's a little bit narrative and obviously mostly a, of a, a doc and it's very exciting well, when I watched the visible out on television um, that Apple had out, yes. that, I mean, I, I had forgotten so much of that. I think we take it for granted a little bit because we're living our lives and we came out a long time ago, but you watch these things and it's like, wow. So I bet this will be the same thing, the equal show that you're doing. I, I hope so. Yeah. I mean, wow. I hope so. There's just, there's so much we don't know and you don't, I, I think my, my fear and my, um, um, my desire and, and, and hope is to um, really make sure we, we know our, and this, again, it, it does actually bring us back to things like this with, with Paley, yeah. that we don't lose our LGBT history um, as we, you know, that, that, that existed prior to that time because nobody excavated it in time, you know, yeah. um, and, and, or because it wasn't told or nobody thought it was important, you know, um, and, and there's still so much more we could be doing, you know, backwards as much as we're doing forwards 
you know, I mean, I, you know, I mean, there's, there's just a lot to still document. There's, um, uh, you know, on Instagram, there's, uh, and I don't know if you've seen the AIDS Memorial on Instagram, there's sort of, uh, and, and, and how powerful that is whenever you see a new person's story, you know, and, and, and I think television has a lot of making up to do in terms of, uh, you know, of, of histories of, of marginalized people. And I include LGBTQ people in, in, in terms of that. And it's, it's the exciting time is that there's a lot of places that want those stories now. And yeah. so, you know, um, I think it's about, you know, trying to, trying to get them down and shot. Totally agree. That was a nice way to bring it all very full circle in our conversation. <laughs> I, I want to ask you one last thing, which I don't think I've ever asked you, but if this career had not worked out and your TV career didn't go anywhere, what did you have a plan B? What was a plan B for you? I was a history, American history minor in uh, <laughs> college. I love American history. So I, I, most of what I read is just all, uh, you know, nonfiction history books uh, and uh, particularly the 20th century and I probably would have been a modern American, you know, American history professor in, in high school or, a, um, you know, something like that. I mean, I, 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 I do love uh, teaching and working with young people yeah. and, and, uh, and, and I'm not so sure that I still won't do that one day, to be honest. <laughs> so um, I like to leave that door open. Yeah, well, and I'm sure you, you still watch a lot of television if you were a history professor or something. That'd exactly. just be part of who you yeah, are. I'd have a little <laughs> bit more time, hopefully, to watch them. <laughs> Yeah, do you have time to watch anything? I mean, because you're probably yeah. watching cuts of your yeah. things, but oh, what, yeah. what no, do you no, watch? No. We have, no, we do. I, I have, uh, I try to watch, I watch my cuts more like maybe when I'm like working out a little bit or in the mornings because I take notes yeah. and everything. And yeah. then at night at a certain time after we put our kids down is like, you know, we fall asleep with in, in this time in the pandemic stuck at home. We're so exhausted for some reason. I don't know if you are. We're so tired by like 8.30. <laughs> we fall asleep at 8 o'clock, 8.30, 9 o'clock. But we, the kids go down around 7.30 and then, um, you know, 7, 7.30 and then, and then we go and watch, catch up on stuff. And um, I've just been falling in love with what we do in the shadows. I'm almost all the so way through. So good. Yeah. It's amazing. It's, it's so I, good. I, I tend to watch a lot of what I wouldn't make. So, you know, half hours, new, you know, again, docs, news things, just things that I'm not in as much because then I'm not thinking about, well, how did they do that story thing? Yeah. Or how did they do this? So um, love that. And, and I've just, we just started a rewatch. This is my second rewatch of the Golden Girls. So, oh. I, <laughs> so I'm like, I've gone, I did a rewatch of it years ago, like probably a decade ago. And now I'm doing like a whole, <laughs> and it's been, it's been really comforting because it makes me feel like, you know, a young, a young kid again. Yeah, and I think we're all looking for those things that kind of take our mind off of things. I've been right. watching a lot of Parks and Recreation and Seinfeld right. and shows like that. So, yeah. yeah. Well, Greg, thank you so much for joining us for the special Pride Month Paley Front Row Conversation presented by City. Um, everybody, please be sure to support the Paley Center and consider becoming a Paley member by visiting paleycenter.org. I'm Jim Halterman. Thanks for being here. Thanks again, Greg. Thank and you. everybody, please take care. Thank you. Thanks.